with the dawn of the internet age, it's very prominent for people to define themselves in a number of ways. Sometimes people define themselves by their vocation, others by their ethnicity. In recent years, some define themselves by their sexuality. Whatever the dominant factor of one's life tends to influence us the most. We view that as, this is who I am in one sense or another. But in the scriptures, God reminds us that the thoughts and the inclinations of the heart shape the reality of who we are. I remember reading for the first time in King James, I believe it was Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh, so he is. Some other translations over time have changed that, but that has some important truths to consider. Our thoughts shape our thinking, which ultimately shape our actions. Our thought life matters, because on our own, we're too easily preoccupied with ourselves. I know I am. And unsurprisingly, it forms the basis of who we are and who we will become. We spend so much time each day thinking, whether we think about it or not. And so we need to, as one pastor said some time ago at a conference, we need to think about our thinking. And today's passage addresses the subject of our setting our minds on one of only two things. It brings all the possibilities in the world, all the possibilities from birth to death, and says there's only two ways of thinking. And it has eternal consequences. Each of them will define us. One, it says, will lead to spiritual death. The other one, to life and peace spiritually. So, let's turn to Romans 8. And let's see what God has to say in this passage. And pray that the Holy Spirit will illuminate our minds and our hearts. We will read from chapter 8 of Romans, verse 1 to 8 together. Our focus will be from verse 5 to 8. Hear now the word of the Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Let us pray. Father, we are before you, and we ask that through the Holy Spirit now, you would illuminate our minds and our hearts. The work that only you can divinely do for your glory, for our good, in the name of Jesus we ask. Amen. Last week, we began the anticipated journey of Romans 8. And we briefly considered how deep in which this chapter of the Bible has been for believers through the ages. It begins, as we recalled, in verse 1, no condemnation. It ends at the end of the chapter with no separation, and throughout it says no defeat in the middle. So it's victory and grace and mercy throughout this chapter. In this one chapter, we also see how wonderfully rich the teaching of the person of the Holy Spirit is and his gracious work in everyone who is born again. 
In the first four verses last Sunday, we considered that God's people are set free because of his liberating work. We captured those verses in that phrase. Today, we'll look at verse 5 to 8. And I want us to consider the clear distinction that is drawn out of these verses. So here's the main point of emphasis that I think is there. Setting our minds on the things of the world leads to death. But setting our minds on the Holy Spirit leads to life and peace. There's only two ways. It boils it down, every possible thing that we can think of, into one of two categories. The world in the flesh and God in the Spirit. Setting the mind on the things of the flesh, being a self-centered living, and desiring the delicacies of the world that it promises every day. Setting the mind on the things of the Holy Spirit are for those who are saved, that are born again, to do and to enjoy in Christ. The contrast we're about to see today is between two opposite kinds of living. They are two opposite kingdoms and two opposite kings that we serve. So as we give careful attention, there's a question that we could keep asking ourselves. And this is the question. What defines me? Is it the flesh or is it the Holy Spirit? What defines me? Look, I know it's easy when we hear certain things to think, oh, I know that person. I know what defines them now. That's the easy thing because we're, we're, we're relational beings. We struggle with relationships, but we have to go back again and again and say, what defines me? There's a time perhaps to address the other individual, but let it first address our hearts, starting with me. So there's only two observations I want to share with you. And here's the first one as a result of this. Number one, believers are set free to walk according to the Holy Spirit. We see this being captured in verse 5 and 6. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, always divides mankind into two categories, unbelievers and believers, the flesh and the spirit. There never has been a third category. There are some, unfortunately, in the name of Christ, who have tried to develop a third category. Either we're in the kingdom or we're not. And that's important to clarify. In fact, the entire witness of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, summons us to consider that there is only two ways to live. From the very first chapter of Romans, Paul has been careful to describe the rebellious heart of everyone in the world. In fact, in Romans 1, he taught that everyone knows that there is a creator God, but they don't want him. Romans 2, he taught that everyone has some kind of law, but they don't obey it. There is no one righteous, and no one seeks after God. Romans 5, he explained why every single person has rejected God. Because we're all children of Adam, and we have inherited his sinful nature. You know, uh, my son turned 11 um, yesterday, and I put up a picture, and somebody's like, he looks just like you. Well, we sin just like Adam. Right? We have it. We don't have to fight for that. It just naturally comes to us. And in Romans 6, Paul said that Christ has set the believer free from the rule and reign of sin. And then in Romans 7, he taught us the sinful nature is so evil that trying to keep God's word on our own will not defeat it. And that's where we land in Romans 8, this rich chapter that we learned last week that the sinful nature is so wicked, so wicked, that it takes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to accomplish this redemptive plan so that we can have the Holy Spirit and live for Him as holy people. There are many religions and philosophies that claim that one can overcome the problem of sin and evil with the mind, they say. And so they prescribe a remedy. And I've had a number of conversations. I've read their stuff. But it ends up being another wheelhouse that you're running into, just trying to keep harder and harder and harder, and then prescribe another thing to only get frustrated. The point that was made in Romans 7 is that the mind can never defeat the sinful nature. But the world keeps saying, you could do it. It's all in here. So now in verse 5 and 6, Paul moves from the basis of our justification, that is Christ and his work for us. We read that in verse 4. 
to the application. If Jesus saved us, here is the reality of it. Here's the implication. Here's how your life should look like, Christian, he says. Christ in us through the Holy Spirit, how we live and walk. So look with me to verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. The use of the word mind in this passage is important. It's used at least five times. And it's helpful to understand this word mind carries the idea that one is continually thinking and desiring something. It can be the flesh and its desires, or it can be the spirit and its desires that come from it. There's a continual thought. You can't stop thinking about it. You don't even know. It just is there in the back end. It is constantly working. It's like an operating system that you use. It's constantly processing in the back end. It never gets shut off. And that is what he's saying. You're setting your mind on something. The flesh is not just like skin and bones, not just our body physically, but it represents the characteristics of our fallen nature, that Adam's nature that we have that is bent on following those desires and those inclinations that every single person has from birth to death apart from Christ. The mind that is on the things of the flesh is about what we think, the way the world thinks. We adopt the ideas of, say, popular culture. Okay, so if you're into popular culture, which is hard to ignore in the dawn of digital media, right? It pops up on your screens, it's, it's everywhere, it's on buses. Like, it's so hard to ignore. And so we end up thinking about those things, emphasizing what the world thinks is important and pursuing whatever the world is seeking, all of this in disregard to God's revealed will. So the contrast of minds here are the world and its desires and the spirits and its desires are very different aims, opposite. They don't even go in the same trajectory. So the believer who has been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ is now indwelt by the Holy Spirit and aims to live for God. So one seeks to enjoy the God of the Bible as he or she communes with him by humbly receiving his word, by seeking him in prayer, and fellowshipping among God's people. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is leading them. You know, we don't have to over-spiritualize this. The leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives must begin with the fundamental things of communion with God. Without that, don't think about the other things. These are the fundamental things of God leading you and I daily in this reality. I suppose it's possible to read verse 5 and think this is just a common struggle for everyday Christian. So, let's be clear. The contrast here is between a born-again believer and someone who is not, someone who is not a Christ follower, someone who has the Holy Spirit, and someone who does not. That is the contrast being drawn out in verse 5. That's why I said earlier there's no third middle category. It's one or the other. It is natural for the unbeliever, whose mind and body and spirit are both given over to the service of sin, to reject this. But the supernatural work of the gospel will empower the Christ follower whose body and spirit are given over to the service of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul is arguing for. If the Spirit of God is leading you, then we're to follow him in his worship and service. Again, there are religions that will say, hey, listen, um, the, the body is bad, but the spirit is good. And some will cut, some will do all kinds of stuff to punish themselves and conclude that one can redeem him or herself by focusing simply on the mind. But you know what today's passage is telling us? It takes it to the heart and mind, the sinful nature, and renders them hopelessly stained by sin in needing needing of divine cleansing. The gospel says, listen, your body, your soul, your mind is stained with sin. It's hopeless. There's nothing within you, not an ounce within you, to redeem yourself. The gospel work from the inside out. God addresses the mind and the heart which dictates what the body does. Now, some may argue 
What about the person who's very moral? Like they don't do this kind of stuff. They don't live this kind of way. Like they're very nice and respectful and they give to charity. All those good things. Now, he or she may not indulge in open sin. They may pay their taxes. They may do all of these good things. And they don't cheat their spouse and they don't get drunk. In fact, they don't even curse. Well, Romans 8 tells us that the person who's not in Christ but is well-spoken and tries to respect others and gives to the charity and fights for justice is equally void of the Spirit. Like the one who's living an open, immoral life because they are both without Christ. We tend to think too easily that the gospel is just for those who are living in open rebellion with their lives and their words and their actions. That's true, but also it could be the story of the two brothers in Luke 15. The older one was very moral, kept the rules, but led him to pride. So our good works, our rule-keeping can lead us to pride. Both extremes are void of the gospel. So, in fact, Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, describes the mindset before encountering Christ. He actually thought he was right before God. He actually thought he was pleasing God and getting his approval by doing what? By persecuting Christians. He was a religious man. His mindset was off. He was delusioned. So what happens when people continue to live in a state of pursuing their own pleasure? Well, verse 6 tells us this. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So again, Paul contrasts the two ways to walk. According to the flesh, the unconverted life, where the mind is controlled, the inner being, the center of one's life, is set on the things of the flesh, of the world and his desires, and is heading, he says, for death. There's only one destination. Or it's set according to the Holy Spirit, who invades us and therefore is heading to life and peace. You know, there is no, uh, there's not a description of physical death but a description of a spiritual death. The unsaved person will continue to live in a state that is unresponsive to the things of God. We may say, oh yeah, okay, but it is unresponsive. We can't obey it. Why? How can I obey God without the Holy Spirit? I remember the first time reading Mark, Matthew chapter 5. I was yet to be saved, but God in His grace it just, just kept me reading. And I remember reading chapter 5 thinking, this is such a beautiful way of living. But you know what? I, didn't have, I wasn't saved. I, I couldn't live it. I wanted it. I was frustrated until I came to understand that this is the life lived because of the gospel, because you're saved. You're in the kingdom. You're filled with the Holy Spirit, and you daily seek to live this in the power of the Spirit. But it drew me. It, it gave me a desire for it. I just could not. unless the Holy Spirit brings about conviction of sin and conversion of the heart because of Christ's finished work. That's where it all starts. So the focus of verse 5 and 6 should not be missed, must not be missed. God is very concerned of how Christ followers think and how we're influenced and how we influence others. Not only are we influenced, but we influence other people in our lives, be it our children, our friends, our colleagues, whether we like it or not. And what we believe is what we will share with them, directly or indirectly. So God is concerned. This is not a, a call to simply be religious because that does not automatically translate into being mindful to the things of God or of the Holy Spirit. Neither is it to simply know the right set of theological beliefs. I know my Bible. Don't tell me what to do. Well, that there is a contradiction in itself. To know the Bible is important. To know God's Word is important. But just knowing it doesn't mean anything. No is it just saying a prayer that we're just going to go to heaven now. But being a Christ follower is more than giving a verbal agreement to a certain beliefs. It is to be born again. That's what Jesus says to Nicodemus. You must be born again. And he left scratching his head. But the gospel helps us see that. And since being born again is the work of the Holy Spirit, it is right to insist 
that those who are truly born again will have their mind set on what God desires. Do you see the uh, connection there? If we're truly born again, we have the Holy Spirit, and there is a divine desire that God gives us to follow Him and desire His will. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, the English preacher, tells of a story about William Wilberforce, the, uh, who fought against slavery in the British Empire, and his friend William Pitt. Wilberforce was in the parliament. William Pitt was the prime minister. And Wilberforce was born again, and William Pitt was what he considered to be a cultural Christian. Because all of Britain that time you know, adhered to some form of Christianity in one way or another. Uh, in fact, Wilberforce wrote a book to uh, dispel the idea of just cultural Christianity. So anyways, one day Wilberforce was excited because this very well-known preacher who preached the gospel was preaching in town. And he finally got his friend, William Pitt, to come with him. And so they go together, and he preaches, from what I read, a spirit-filled message, like a very powerful gospel message. And on the way out, Wilber, uh, Wilberforce is just eager to hear what his friend thought. And his friend, the prime minister... William Pitt turns to him and says, I have no clue what this man was talking about today. Unless the Spirit of God opens our eyes and our hearts, what I do and what you do cannot save them. We do it by faith in Jesus Christ and then we trust in the Spirit to do the work. William Pitt was deaf to God as if he was a physically dead man. What this means is this. We can listen to the Bible being read, preached and prayed, but unless the Holy Spirit awakens the sinner, convicts the sinner, gives the sinner a new heart that worships God for who he is and what he's done, we're still spiritually dead people. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So, this is why we need the Holy Spirit to do this divine work in us. Now, if you are not a Christ follower, I hope this text is leading us to realize that attending, giving, doing good work, none of those things replaces what the Spirit of God does in us. If that has not happened, then we're not a Christ follower. So if we're not a Christ follower, the question, friend, is what defines you? What defines you? God creates mankind, mankind to flourish in relationship with Him, enjoying Him, knowing Him as we live in the world. So being controlled by our own desires rather than His can only lead to a life that is far less than it should be. To death, in fact, Paul says here. It will eventually lead to conflict internally and with others. Instead of peace, it leads to slavery instead of freedom. Death rather than life. If you are unsure and unable to say that Christ defines you and the Holy Spirit is in you, then, friend, it is of utmost importance that you do not rest until you are truly in Christ. You may think that you have other pressing matters to deal with and perhaps give this thought later. That's what Satan wants you to think. You have other things. Yeah, this is important. Maybe later. It's his age-old tactic. But if this passage and what it's saying is true, then you can't ignore the gospel why? Because life and death are set before each of us. Nothing in all of our lives comes close to this truth. So it's worth every second that we pursue it with a humble heart. If you do, then the Holy Spirit may take His Word, cut our hearts, and call us out of darkness and save us and give us grace, mercy, and peace. Trust that as God has been gracious in opening your eyes to your true condition, that He will also work the grace to bring about the death of our old and the newness of the Christian life. He does that. He does that.
an application for Christ followers who are born again. This is obvious, but the Bible often repeats the obvious because we're forgetful people. And that's this. Spiritual matters must be important to us. Spiritual matters must be. It is a non-negotiable thing for us. When we are born again, we are made alive to God through the Holy Spirit. This means that spiritual matters now make sense to me. I remember still, and it's still the conviction of that I'm so grateful for. We now live in a new reality. No more are believers at war with God. Romans 5.1 tells us we're at peace with God. So we're at peace with Him. No more war. And we live with Him and Him in us. I remember when I was an unbeliever, blinded by my sin and my own self-righteousness, I went out of my way to fill the void that only God can fill. Each of us try to fill that void that only God can fill, and you can write down what that blank was for you. For me, it was sports, friends, it was partying, it was car, whatever it was, a relationship. I tried to fill that. I went out of my way so hard But now, believers are at peace with God, which means with the daily empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we will go out of the way to honor Him. The other way. We're called to go out of the way, but here's the thing, not on our own, through the strength of the Holy Spirit in us, to honor Him. And how does that look like? Well, we honor Him in our relationship, in our marriage, in our homes, with our children. And when we fail, we repent. We call an individual aside, please forgive me, and Trust me, I have to do it quite often in my home with my kids. And I'm grateful. Although I hate the weaknesses in my life, I'm grateful for the Holy Spirit's conviction that I don't just go give a lame excuse, that I must be particular about what the sin was and repent. And so that's the work of the Spirit in us. When we get up each day, we must preach this to our hearts. That we are adopted children of a gracious God who has poured His Spirit into our hearts and that is shaping our minds so we become more and more like His Son. Having said this, we look now at our second and last point, and that's this. Without the Holy Spirit, we are slaves to sin, verse 7 and 8. So first, we're set to live and walk in the Spirit, but without Him, the implication is that we are slaves to sin. This once again calls each of us to look into our hearts and take honest stock to where each of us are spiritually. Look at verse 7. For, again, that for could be because in the word Greek, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. You know, it, Paul wrote at a time where the Roman army was quite around. And when you hear of military language today, you'll see this hostile territory. That's no joke. You go in there and you get killed. And so very careful. And he's saying, listen, if you set your mind on the things of the world, you're actually at war with God. You're, you're hostile towards him. You're not actually a nice person. There's no such thing as that. There is a hostility that we cannot do anything about on our own. It takes it to another level in verse 7. It looks at the person who claims to be all nice and believing that their own, own virtue will be pleasing to God and get them into heaven and says, hey, you're actually hostile to God. This is why the mind that is set on the flesh is an important thing to consider. It's important to understand that the mind is not a neutral ground. Again, it cannot love one way of thinking and reject it has to reject the other. The mind that is set on the flesh will one day, or one way or another, um, in word or sooner in deed, treat God and the desires of the Holy Spirit as an enemy, sooner or later, if we're set on the world and the flesh. Um, in my life prior to being born again, I realized how I would, in a certain way, I would do my, I would, the way I was thinking and my desires and course of action was not helpful. I've made some changes sometimes. I remember as a teenager, I thought, you know what, I can overcome this thing. So I did it. I stopped doing this thing. And you know, about a week later, I was like, yeah, 
I got it all together. Look at me. And look at my friend. He's still stuck in that thing. And what happened? I had a fall. And it was bruised me pretty bad. And so it, this, this thing where we try to change ourselves, we can. People change their diets, their nutrition. People change a lot of stuff. And, and they post about it. And we boast about it. But any attempts of uprooting the bad left in me, left me in perpetual frustration. Why? Because I could never remove the root of my sin in my mind and in my heart. That's the problem. Again, let me quote Warren Worsby from last week as well. Where there is no fruit, it must be the fruit. And the fruit here is, if the Holy Spirit is not there in the root of my life, the fruit is just going to be evident eventually. Or I can be like when Jesus looks at the tree from far and says, there's the leaves, and he goes close to the fig tree, there is no fruit. A form of religiosity, but no fruit. And what happens to that tree? Well, it gets cursed as a teaching moment for the disciples of what happens even when we try to use religion as a way to mask our sin. But God accomplishes this work in us by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the work of the Spirit in our hearts. Until that happens, sin will remain our master. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. First you're hostile, and then it's, you can't. It's impossible. Why can't we please God in the flesh? Well, Tim Keller makes a really helpful observation here. He says that the mind that drives the action is acting out of hostility to God, the person, controlled by their own flesh, is able to have a thought that is good or perform an action that is right, but it cannot please God since that thought is done in opposition to Him. Even when we do good things, as a, if I'm not in Christ and I'm doing a good thing, I'm still doing it in opposition to God. I'm doing it on my own. So let's consider this for a moment. It's fair to say that life and death are set before us and we must give this our greatest attention now. So if that's true then one practical way for us to respond to today's passage is do a self-assessment, each of us, where we are and what defines us. So, two questions for us. I think it'll be on the screen. There you go. The first is, what is the direction of your life? What defines me? Consider our thought life, our private moments, our public moments, Consider our view of God and how that informs us, our lives, our decision-making, our friends. Just think about the direction of our lives, the things that are happening, relationally, vocationally, okay? That's number one. And that should inform us. And can I encourage you, when we do this, if you're in a discipleship relationship, um, Talk to them about that. Don't just do it on our own in our own little echo chamber and then put it away. Secondly, what do you do when your will or desire comes against God's will? Okay, this is the everyday butting heads with God that people have. What do you do when your will and desire comes against God's will? We should not take this lightly. How we respond to everyday moments where our will and my desire comes in conflict with God's revealed will in His Word says a lot about if we're walking in the Holy Spirit. It says a lot more than we think. Is it fight through the Spirit or is it flight in the flesh? We're doing one thing or another. Are we fighting and walking? Or is it flight? Is it fight the sin with the help of the Spirit or flight in the flesh and enjoys fleeting pleasures one more time for the thousandth time? Ask this question in the area of pleasure, possession, status, food, entertainment, idea of fun. Do you see that? It's a framework of thinking. Okay, in these areas, am I, how am I responding when it's conflicting against God's will? Whether it be food, whether it be clothing, whether it be pleasures and, and entertainment. And if we factor God's will and walk away when it conflicts or comes against His ways, then we know the Holy Spirit is convicting us and working in us. Or 
We avoid that consideration because we're unable to withstand it and we give in. I'm not preaching perfectionism. I'm just talking about the general direction of our lives it needs to be informed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And what do I do in the everyday run-in-the-mill decisions that comes to me? A matter of relationship, food, entertainment. I, I use entertainment because it's so much in our face. My friend was sharing not long ago that Netflix releases data from time to time. And they said this, this one show, I've never watched it, it's called um, Stranger Things. They released a whole season and 200 and something thousand people watched the entire season in one day. That's called binge watching. So whatever, I don't even know the content. What I'm saying is we receive so much of it. Do you think it's God's will for us to do that? Just, we need to ask. And if the Spirit is not convicting us, it's a wake-up call to think, like, okay, I need to revisit the gospel. I want the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, and I want other loving Christians to be able to affirm that as they watch my life being lived out. That's why the local church is so important. So here's the implication. If you are not always fighting against sin in your life, then you have made peace with it. I think it leads us to consider this. For not fighting against it. Not perfectionism, but it's a daily fight. We're at war. That's why Ephesians 6 gives us the armor of God. And it's not a solo war. We do it with one another. We walk together side by side, upholding each other's dignity. We fight together. But if we are not, we may have made peace with that instead of peace with God. And if that's the case... Again, are we void of the Holy Spirit? Because He is the mark of us being born again. Romans 5 to 8 gives us a deep well of assurance of our salvation. And if God did the hard thing, what is the hard thing that God did? Saving sinners through the death of His Son and resurrection. Then He's intending, He will do the easy. What is that? Bring us to glory on that last day. So we don't have to worry about losing our salvation. The question here is, are we in Christ? Are we saved? Do you and I have the Holy Spirit? And we need to consider that. This passage is meant for you and I to examine ourselves and see if our lives, public and private, resembles a life where the Holy Spirit is leading, is influencing, is taking us to God's Word, is cultivating fellowship and a godly concern for my family and other people. That's where I think we can start. Where there is little or no interest for God in our daily life, it would be unwise for another Christian to come to that person and simply say, keep trying, just keep trying. No. It needs to be a wake-up call to examine our faith in light of Romans 8 and what it has to say and think, am I walking in the Holy Spirit? then what is a sure sign of the Holy Spirit? Let me close by quoting Jonathan Edwards. 200 years ago, he wrote a treaty of the religious life. And he says, it boils down to whether the person has his or her mind set on the things of the Spirit of God and whether this is moving as it must in the direction of true righteousness, to the ways of God. If we are living our lives mainly for our own benefit and not for the glory of God and the benefit of others, then we're living in the flesh and we will spiritually die. So, what is the general direction of our lives and our hearts? Romans 8 compels us to ask the question, is the reality of God's gracious work and presence evident in our inmost being? Are the people who watch me and you closely in the local church and outside, would they look at this text and say, this is true about you, K. Savan, or this is true about you, Josh, or this is true about you? Would they say that? Nothing in all of life comes even close to this one matter of importance. It is worth every minute of consideration that the Holy Spirit may work in us to save us so that our soul would prosper in Jesus Christ and our lives would bear evidence of the Holy Spirit who gives life and peace. The main point, setting our minds on the things of the world leads to death. 
but setting our minds on the things of the Holy Spirit leads to life and peace. May it be so. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We ask now, Holy Spirit, that you would take and you would help each of us examine our hearts. Lead us not to being despair of trying to be perfect, but lead us through the work of your Spirit to be sensitive, to hear, to know, to feel the convictions, even in a physical sense, we ask. Grant us disgust for the sins that we struggle with, Lord, the thing that we have made light of that dishonors your name and your fame, public or private. And let us be right with you through the work of your Son who took upon our sin. I ask for your deep mercy and deep grace in each of us, beginning with me, Lord, where we have failed to display the work of the Spirit in our lives. And I ask for those who are here who are unsure and unclear to see if they have the Holy Spirit and they may even think that they are Christians. We ask that today you would, Lord, use this opportunity, God, to bring greater gospel clarity that we would turn and trust and follow Jesus and receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that you do this for your name, for your fame, and for your glory that we may prosper in Jesus Christ.